Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to day three of the Oxford Future of Major Programme Management Conference for 2022. Wherever you are, you're very welcome to join us. And we've tried to um, structure these sessions and make them work for time zones around the world. So it'd be very interesting to see and hear from you about where you are and how, we would, how you're tuning in. Very quickly, I'm just going to, have to talk about yesterday, a quick review of day two. Um, fascinating day to sit and listen to all of the content. We started off with a fascinating discussion, uh, a keynote from Neri Woods, who's the Dean of Blavatnik School of Government um, at the University of Oxford. And um, as a set of ideas and as a set of um, content put forward, it was incredibly thought provoking. We then had a panel on the tr uh, trends at the social cutting edge, so leading in extreme operating environments. And what defines extreme, what, what extreme is, is obviously different for different people, different programs around the world. And we discussed um, with, with the contributors and uh, in the panel, lots of different ways that we can discuss uh, um, and position the idea of, ext of extreme. And the conclusion, the output from that panel, from that discussion, uh, was that things are getting more extreme rather than less extreme, which is kind of counter to the um, the, the narrative that's certainly been in place um, in in recent times. And then Maria Basharov at the at the end of the session yesterday um, talked about bringing bringing these themes together very neatly. So today, day three, um, we're going to start off at twelve fifteen with um, a video. Um, contribution from uh, Wendy Akola, who is, uh, I'll introduce Wendy a little bit more in a second or two, uh, but from NASA. Wendy's in the, uh, on, on the west coast of, of America, therefore for her it's very early in the morning, hence it being done by video. The video is about 40 minutes long, and then Daniel's going to come back in and pick up some of the themes in discussion, which will take us round to about uh, quarter past one, so 13.15. We'll then have a break for a quarter of an hour or so, uh, and then have a panel. Um, this is trends um, and the technological cutting edge, so leading big science. We'll then have another short break, and then Daniel will come back in uh, along, with, along with myself to spend a bit of time talking about a closing review and then reflection on the themes and particularly the questions that have been thrown up in the past two or three days. And then Daniel will, will finish with a call to action. I just want to remind you that we do have a drop-in session today. Um, it's not actually at the times I've shown there, I don't think. You know, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, the drop-in session is, um, I'm just checking up there. I'm sorry, it is, yes, it, 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 is, at, it is at one o'clock, sorry. Um, so um, if you are interested in talking about MMPM with our recruitment team, uh, with, with, with Kate, uh, then at one o'clock to 1.30, there is this drop-in session. So please do um, go uh, via hop-in if you wish. The panel at half past one um, is, as I said, on trends and the technological cutting edge. And we have five great contributors um, for that panel. Um, what would be very useful, um, as, as we've done the past two days, if you do have questions, please just keep them coming in uh, because at the end we can talk about uh, and address the questions with the panel. And that's worked well on day one and day two to, um, to get lots of interaction from the audience. We come back in later on. I would also ask you know, if you do have questions about what we've discussed the past past couple of days and indeed today, please do send them in so we can address those in the session at quarter past three. So on to the conference. <clears throat> and as we've done in the in, on day one and day two, we have a keynote speaker with 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 one of these um, CVs or these these uh, um, bios that that, um, that that go on for for pages and. These pages are not filled for the sake of them being filled. They are filled with very relevant, very, very contemporary experience. So we're delighted that, that, that Dr. Wendy Akola can join us, albeit via video. Um, as you can see from the, from the slide there, um, this, is, this is somebody who's steeped in space, but space technology for the future. Um, obviously, what NASA is doing as an organization, which Wendy will take you through, is all about what comes next. 
Um, and uh, this is this is the, the point of this um, of contextualizing this within major programs. As you can see, um, Wendy is an achiever in lots of different ways, not not just in engineering, but also in her role in pushing um, the boundaries of what what um, is is considered to be careers, what's considered to be um, at the natural space um, for people. Um, of colour um, in, in this context. So I won't go into this in too much detail. It's up to Wendy to do that. But I would encourage you to um, visit um, social media to get engaged and, and to, to understand the work that Wendy does. Okay, so um, this session that Wendy's doing starts at quarter past 12. So I'm going to stop there and then we'll put up a, a slide in a second, which will tell you when the, when the session starts. As I say, this is a, a, a video um, uh, section uh, because of the time zone that Wendy's in. Uh, but Daniel will be coming back in uh, at the end of the video and engaging in a, in a live Q&A or a live discussion about the content that Wendy puts forward. Hello, um, my name is Wendy Okolo and I am an aerospace research engineer at the NASA Ames Research Center, smack dab in the center of Silicon Valley, California. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me, um, Daniel. Um, Daniel invited me to this conference uh, to give the keynote at this global biennial um, Future of Major Programs conference um, at uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, because he, you know, was looking for something in terms of like technological cutting edge and what it takes to lead big science and high technology driven research and development type projects. And he thought I fit the bill. No pressure, no pressure. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to um, convey what that means for me um, in terms of not just conducting, you know, performing what is considered high um, cutting edge research, um, but what 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 that has been for me in terms of my experiences and what I think is important and what we need to consider, you know, in the future moving forward. So I'm going to probably start, you know, with this chronological timeline of what it is that I've um, had a chance to do, and then reflect as 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 I was asked to on um, on the key things that stood out for me in terms of not just performing the research and the work that I've gotten to do. Um, but what what was important and, and key drivers for success and where, you know, we could possibly make change here and there. So uh, a little about me. I am an aerospace research engineer by training, um, did my undergrad and PhDs in aerospace research engineering from the University of Texas at Arlington. And when I was an undergraduate student, um, you know, in this cool aerospace engineering world and taking classes and doing all this fun stuff, I was told and I, you know, I heard and learned that, hey, it's very important that you do an internship. You need to do an internship so that you can be um, competitive uh, in the job market when you graduate. So, okay, do an internship, do an internship. They said, they said it's very important. I said, okay. So I, I sought one out and um, the largest defense contractor, um, aerospace uh, engineering defense contractor for, for the United States, uh, Lockheed Martin. And I got the opportunity to do an internship working on Orion. Orion is a NASA uh, capsule, a NASA project that is supposed to return astronauts to the moon and beyond. And um, I got that opportunity for, for two summers, two consecutive summers. And I remember back then just kind of being thrust into this real world application and not kind of understanding you know, the impact, the importance, and, you know, even the funding, right, what was required to kind of carry out, successfully conduct and carry out this project from start, from conception to, to fruition. Um, and I, I was just simply driven by checking boxes, right? I was driven by, hey, I need to do this internship. I need to look good um, in front of the company, in front of the people that I got to work with so that they, you know, possibly hire me back. And I, I, I went with the flow. Also, at that time, I didn't know if I wanted to do, you know, aero, more aero than space. This aerospace really is a fusion of aero, more um, kind of lower altitude planes, UAVs, drone, air taxi kind of applications, and then space, which is more astro, um, where you are operating in low Earth orbit and, and beyond. 
And so I didn't know if I wanted to do more error than space or more space than that error. So I was just, you know, kind of going with the flow and was focused a little on learning, but was, but was heavily driven by checking boxes and, you know, kind of reflecting on that now, um, I, I see that, you know, especially, you know, when you're leading, you know, a project of that scale, you kind of have to understand and know the different pieces of the puzzle and the, the dynamics of whoever is kind of working, you know, under such a project and how they're invested or not invested, you know, in, in, in the project. So to give you some, some more context, the rollout for Orion, um, for Artemis, so Orion is part of this big, big program for NASA called Artemis. And Artemis um, is going to put the next, um, the first person of color and first woman on the moon. And they had a rollout in March, just, what, just two months ago, where you got to see kind of Orion on this large um, SLS uh, rocket, right? Kind of like the, the rocket launcher on top, under underneath the, the capsule that will hold the astronauts. And that, again, gave me an opportunity to kind of reflect and say, wow. I was a piece of this multi-billion dollar program, right? That will put the first person of color and the first woman on the moon. And at the time I didn't, I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't really understand the impact of such a thing. So at that time I was driven by checking boxes, but now I can kind of understand and put myself back there and say, hmm, what would I have done differently? What you know? What opportunities may may I have have may have I may I have missed that that I would kind of want to go back in you know and do a little differently? And how am I learning from that um, today? So I you know I had those opportunities in in undergrad for multiple summers, getting to work work with the um, mechanical design team on the hatches for the vehicle, which is basically the doors, and then the systems engineering team more requirements, more overview. Um, and drafting and maintaining and managing requirements from you know from start to finish. So I got that opportunity that was great and you know went back to school, realized I really liked school, so I stayed in school, I went to grad school. And um, in grad school I got to work on really cool stuff. Um, my primary dissertation research was in aircraft formation flight, kind of like birds when they fly long distances in extended formations to save fuel. So aircraft can, you know, can do the same. You can get the same benefit. Um, when I said birds to save fuel, I meant save energy. But you can get the same benefit with with aircraft, with planes, and then they're saving um, they're saving fuel. And so um, we spent some time doing that, and it was it was a smaller team really of myself and my dissertation advisor. And um, you'd, we, we'd spend our summers at the Air Force Research Lab as well with, uh, with a sponsor and an aerodynamicist who worked to get us the aerodynamic data that we needed to build our model um, for simulation, right? To be able to simulate the effects of flying aircraft information and what kind of magnitudes of fuel savings were we going to see. And in that, you know, within that project, I was driven by some delivery, you know, delivery checking boxes, but a lot of curiosity, a lot of curiosity, um, a lot of gratification. Um, gratification was always, you know, prevalent in my story. I was very, very gratified, very happy to uh, to discover results that fit a hypothesis that we had, you know. And when I mean, when the results didn't fit, it was it was kind of disheartening, but um, it was it was very gratifying. I would I would say that. And I got to I, I got to um, publish research, uh, the work that I got to do. That's when I, you know, started to win a few awards here and there for for the work that I was doing. Um, very small person team, I'd say, but I mean three people max. But the potential of this work was was far reaching. Um, so it's us looking at how much fuel could be saved by following aircraft in formation flight. But this work was demonstrated. I mean, you had the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, Vry Patterson Air Force Base invested in this work, um, and they also worked with industry partners as well. Uh, Boeing uh, was involved in this work, and they had uh, military. They actually had flight tests using, like, uh, tanker aircraft and uh, fighter aircraft to quantify those fl those f those flight savings. And at this time, I really started to understand the impact of the work. You know, I was understanding and feeling very gratified by it. Um, but there were still, you know, complexities and challenges, right? Um, 
at the time, you know, I, I, like I said, I spent some time at the Air Force Research Lab and sometimes I'd need data that that wasn't there. And so I'd have access to military documents and specifications. And if I knew something was 10 meters long, I could do like a ratios and I'd literally pull out a ruler and do some ratios and calculations and get an estimate of, of what it is that I needed, you know, in relation to that 10 meter long uh, parameter that I had. Um, I also got to do some uh, some interesting um, unprecedented study that that I didn't know I'd have to do towards the end and that had very little clarity in in the instructions that were provided by the references that I found. So I spent some time putting those instructions together um, and it was very, very detailed in my own PhD dissertation and the write-up so that if someone wanted to re redo that analysis or wanted to use that as, as a basis for conducting their own work, they wouldn't suffer a struggle struggle the way the way I did. Um, so that was interesting, and I know that I was I was driven by curiosity with a little bit of del a delivery. But I understood. I started to understand really the impact of the work that I was doing. Within that time in graduate school as well, you know, I got to you know spend some time working with um, the advanced development programs of Lockheed Martin, as well, basically Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. And for those of you that may or may not be familiar with Skunk Works, they were the team that developed the SR-71 Blackbird, which basically um, was kind of like an, a secret project within, within the company where the CIA is like, hey, we need, you know, a plane, a spy plane that cannot be shut down, you know, and um, Kelly Johnson, I mean, there have been books written about this plane. It's unbelievable, the SR-71 Blackbird. But, you know, he gathers a team together and they work, you know, intense and, you know, create this amazing spy plane that people talk about. But that small team um, still exists today. I mean, it, this was this was a long time ago, but that kind of advanced development programs team where they focus on kind of high cutting edge research exists today. And I got an opportunity to work with them for almost a year while I was while I was in, uh, in graduate school. So, again, no pressure, um, but I knew hey, this was high delivery, high impact research, I mean, cutting edge research. And what I got to work on was um, doing some um, performance optimizing control. So basically, how can we control a vehicle, um, an aircraft? We're looking at the F-35C. It's a fighter a fighter jet for, for the Navy. It's a variant of the F-35 for, for the Navy. So we're in a NAVAIR contract looking at how we can control this vehicle in a way that is so optimal that um, it reduces fuel use. So all of those control surfaces on the vehicle, how can you kind of streamline their use? And this vehicle was so clean, it was so very, very well optimized that it was even hard to find um, even like half a percent <laughs> of, of fuel savings. Um, and knowing, you know, kind of coming into that that role, coming into that work, knowing that this was such a brilliant team of people that um, kind of had heritage info and kind of had like, you know, just heritage and, and, and rich history of developing, you know, really, really um, amazing things in the past. I, I had my own um, Imposter syndrome, for sure. Like, how how can I contribute, right, to to, to this group of people? But I did. Um, I spent my time going back and doing some due diligence. I was able to find an error that um, enabled our code to converge, and I was very proud of myself for that. So with that, I was driven, you know, a little bit by uh, delivery, um, more delivery than curiosity. I feel like I had the most autonomy with my my dissertation research. I um, mean, just kind of looking back and seeing what drove that and what drives that for the different people, the different phases of, of, of their careers as well. Just kind of letting you know where I was in my career and what was driving me. Um, so I finished up with that, started um, at NASA about in 2016, not too long after uh, my PhD. And I've gotten to work on a number of, you know, really, really cool things at, at NASA, but I'm not going to dwell on every single project. Um, I'm just going to pick a few and, and highlight some some key some key points within them in terms of what what the goal was, what the mission was, and what drove me and possibly what drove the the, the, the other team, the, the other members of the team that I, I was privileged to to work with as well. Um, 
So one of the one of the first I'm going to speak with is speak on is a project called Pterodactyl, and that's the one I'm wearing the shirt for <laughs> for today. Um, so Pterodactyl was an early career project, early career initiative that uh, my team won. So basically, we got a team together, created a video, wrote a proposal, put this pitch together, and submitted to the Space Technology Mission Directorate of NASA, you know, at, at headquarters, they put out a call and says, hey, you know, we want early career teams to form and submit a proposal, create a video as well for what it is that they think they can do with $2.5 million that will advance the state of the art in, you know, in specific areas. And so we did that and we got down selected to submit a final proposal to headquarters from, from our center. Um, and uh, at some point when we're kind of creating the video, I, I got tasked with finding, um, you know, we're going to do this really, really cool, uh, you know, early career, we could really get away with whatever we wanted. So we're going to explain what it is we wanted to conduct in the project and end with a video that, you know, kind of shows us working, walking away from the NASA meatball. And I remember being tasked with finding the music for the, <laughs> for the, the, the video, because I'm, I'm a music person, I like music, and I'll speak to some of that maybe at some point during this presentation. And so I started struggling and thinking of what song, you know, would be best to overlay with the video that we were creating for this, two, I mean, $2.5 million, right? And I was putting myself in the position of the potential reviewers and trying to make sure um, I understood what it is that they were looking for, which is important. And I remember it took so much of my time. <laughs> I remember spending almost a weekend trying to find the right song for for um, for this video and trying to imagine what the judges and uh, reviewers of the project would look like. That it just took so long. At some point, I was like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to pick a song that I want, a song that I was listening to at the time, and it was Future. Um, what was it again? I forget the name of the song, but it was a rap song. I would put it in and submit it. And we were one of the two across the entire agency that were selected and given that $2.5 million to, you know, conduct this research. On our research, what, what we wanted to do in terms of R&D was to take a deployable entry vehicle, which is a novel type of spacecraft, right? So you can imagine spacecraft like Apollo and, um, and the, the MSL, the Mars Science Lab, and, 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 and the way they enter an atmosphere with the the rigid bodies that they have already fully formed. Well, a deployable entry vehicle is basically what it is, an entry vehicle that deploys upon entry. So it's, it doesn't have a rigid fixed form until it enters the atmosphere. It's about to enter the atmosphere. So you can kind of fold it and then deploy it when you're ready. And what's great with that is that you kind of have these, you know, volume and mass savings. And so you can put more in terms of payload, pay, payload to bring something to another planet or uh, return something back to Earth. But how do you control something that deploys? And the one we're working with deployed like like an umbrella. So that was complex. <laughs> um, but because we were early career, I mean, I was driven by curiosity. I was very, very curious and was just interested in in doing whatever in terms of if it broke, that's okay, we'll find something else, right? In terms of the modeling simulation, in terms of the options that we had. And I led the controls team for that, that had researchers at uh, NASA Ames Research Center and the Johns Hopkins Applied uh, Physics Lab with a, with a secondary um, researcher at, at Johnson uh, Space Center. And that was kind of, I would say my first foray into a leadership role, not just for delivery, but driven primarily by, by inspiration. So I wasn't number one on the entire piece, but number one on a smaller piece. Um, so I, I had a responsibility, but the head wasn't as heavy as the person that wore the crown, the principal investigator on that project. Um, so we decided to put these multiple flaps in the vehicle and it was not a trivial problem, but we got to solve it. We put like eight flaps on, on this deployable entry vehicle and we're able to make it fly in the way that we wanted. We looked at other control configurations as well, but um, submitted multiple research papers, published journal publications, and uh, even submitted a patent for the control architecture that uh, that my team was able to come up with. So that was 
intensely gratifying, but so, so exciting, very, very exciting work. And I look back, reflect upon that, and I see that I was driven by so much, so much curiosity um, and working in a domain that was different from what I had worked in in the past. My PhD uh, research area was primarily in aero, you know, because I was working with aircraft. Now here I am working with spacecraft that have dependencies on multiple aerodynamic parameters or properties that I would have not considered, um, you know, in comparison to aircraft operating at lower altitudes. Um, so that was great. That was, you know, that was a wonderful learning opportunity for me. I look back with that on that one with joy and excitement at how curious, how curious I was. Um, I also got to walk, work on the aero side. I've gotten to work on the aero side at NASA. So I gave you a little bit of the space, aerospace, right? I give you a little bit of the space and on the aero side. I've also gotten to work on the aero side as well. And uh, one of the projects I've gotten to work on was, um, it's called the System Wide Safety Project. And I, it's basically looking at, if you look at, an, at the national airspace in the, in the United States today, right, that is kind of predicated on not using a lot of the airspace that exists, um, driven by an architecture and an infrastructure that has existed for decades. Um, and with the novelty and the expected increase, you know, just massive implosion that is forecasted in use of um, unmanned aerial vehicles, air taxis, operations that, I mean, are expected to just expand the use of airspace. We're talking, you know, privacy, ethics, operations, so much is going to change and particularly safety, right? What does safety start to look like when you integrate um, unmanned air vehicles and the airspace, right? Are you going to be flying in your plane and you see a, uh, while well, you take off and you see a UAV zoom by your window and, and what, what does that look like? Or, you know, what is it going to start to look like when we want to order food for delivery and a drone drops it um, in our, in front of our door and flies over our neighbor's yard too? Would, would they be okay with that? You know what? I mean, there are just so much opportunities, but we're looking particularly at the aspect of safety right for um for that and what, what it starts to look like when our when our national airspace changes so i started um on that project as you know just a researcher trying to quantify uh safety um, impacts and risks to things like uh, gps right global positioning system if your uav is flying you know some sort of mission right and we're talking primarily civil applications and it flies under a canopy of trees, for instance, and GPS is lost. Is there a way to predict that that would happen? Because you know the trees are going to be there. You know that the UAV is going to fly along that flight plan, that flight path, right? You have an idea of the flight path. And you might be able to figure out what your satellite configuration is. You should be able to figure out what your satellite configuration is because GPS is a global positioning system that relies on satellites to triangulate and tell you the position of where you are, right? These little cool things in our, in our phones and our cars that can tell us where we are. It's really satellites, but you need at least four and you need them um, spaced apart, like some sort of um, horizontal uh, delusion of uh, position and just you, you need them spaced in a way that you can really triangulate your XYZ, your three positions and fix a clock error, which is time. So can you predict beforehand that this is likely to happen? Or can you predict that even though your GPS um, satellites are there in range or in view, maybe potentially there could be a building um, blocking or there could be a bridge that kind of causes some sort of occlusion. And can you predict that beforehand? So I spent some time doing some of that GPS um, work and analysis as as a researcher and then i got promoted to sub project manager on a piece of that project and all of a sudden right i was this still early career um researcher that was leading and guiding the research of at some point 15 13 to 15 researchers um with phds um masters some interns on how to, you know, conduct research and make sure that we were meeting deliverables, right, in line with what was flowing down our milestones, our project uh, milestones, and uh, what what headquarters and what the aeronautics research mission directorate wanted, you know, of us, what was in line. Um, so I guided that research, also answered to, 
you know, Superior is project manager on the project side and on the center side. So NASA, uh, you know, where I work is as a matrix organization and that you have, you kind of report on the center side, you know, in terms of like your division and where you are to some extent, but you report on the project side as well. So, you know, it's doing that kind of center and project reporting, uh, managing finances and, and trying to lead with, with inspiration and, and of course that's challenging right because you're trying to lead with inspiration but focused really also on the deliverables right what is it that you have to deliver what are your milestones when are they due how much leeway do you have you know and and how i mean how can how can you really balance that so i was you know cognizant of that but then my role and world just expanded i mean if i'm here managing the research but if i get an email from someone in the project that says hey they're out sick or a family member just got COVID. I couldn't not respond to that, right? If 10 of us were on that email, I was the one with the responsibility of making sure that they were okay, uh, making sure that their work uh, was supported and continued and making sure that milestones didn't slip or if they did, um, it was communicated in a fashion that was timely enough such that it didn't impact the project overall. Uh, managing risks, um, technical risks, workforce risk and a project risk and a personal conflict relations and, and, and risk as well. I had to I had to manage that. I mean, what do you do when you're a key subject matter expert in one area is not getting along with one of your brightest, most technically diverse and promising researchers? What do you do and everything else in between, right? Um, and then COVID hit. And so what does it take to lead in such you know, in, in such an unprecedented time, what does it take to lead technology research, right? Um, and development in that kind of time where people are now beginning to get spread apart across centers, working remotely. You can imagine the kind of complexity, <laughs> the com kind of complexity and while you're also managing and helping to support in the ways that you can, of course, right? Uh, people who were, who were dealing with the effects of COVID from a mental health perspective, um, from just even physical, physical health perspective. So with that, you can, I can see myself driven by delivery and responsibility um, and a little curiosity, right? So much less curiosity than the kind of delivery and responsibility as, you know, comparison to pterodactyl where oh there was so much to do and i could do all this fun stuff and i could break things or build them back up as i wanted quite frankly at this time there was really no no time to um to spend on, on being curious that had to be left to the people that were doing the grunt work and the research right when you kind of come up a little higher in perspective you 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 understand and work a little differently so that was me being a uh, a sub project manager on that project and leading these very, very diverse teams. And then the opportunity arose for me to go one step even higher um, on that same, you know, multi million dollar project. And I became uh, the associate project manager for the system wide uh, safety project. And that's different. Again, you know, that's different and different kind of, you know, pressures. I would say I became number three on this bigger project. So more visibility. Um, more uh, significantly closer to kind of the executive program management side now, more in the know, um, driven really by stakes and stakeholders. So it's a gift and a curse, right? Because you have a better understanding of what drives missions, what drives projects, who is thinking what, where the orders are coming from, and what it is that they're looking for. Um, you can, you know, I tr try to carve out some time for curiosity and conducting that basic research and working with interns and still pulling out my math lab from time to time. But most importantly, that understanding of what drives certain in initiatives and certain directives at a, at a higher level is, is where you get to the higher you go with these with leading these kinds of projects. So the science is, you know, is important, but the big picture too is also very important. That big picture administrative of what is driving what, what is driving who, and what is the definition or cause of the milestones and the impact that you're seeing um, on, on how projects are defined. Um, and that that big picture, I mean, just kind of knowing the times that you're in, I think is, is very key. And that's one of the things that I've learned in, in the role of associate project manager that, you know, you can kind of be working in this 
bubble of this is what I want to achieve and this one needs to get done. But if you, if you don't kind of have that understanding and however you get it, you know, through a mentor who might be more in the know or through doing your own external research and seeing where the industry is going or where your organization is going or what is driving, you know, the, um, the dispersion of awards, right? Uh, research grants or uh, funding for certain projects. You you, you kind of need to have that information. I'm going to tell a, a funny story that is related to this. So um, the Grammys this year, a few months ago, had a category of, I believe it was like international, and, and they have it every year, international album or like African album or something along those lines. And the winner for this year was uh, Angelique Kijo, who has won uh, multiple Grammys in the past, older, established, uh, brilliant, just, I mean, very, very well known on the continent of Africa and beyond. And so I'm, I'm Nigerian and, you know, I, I know Nigerian music, I listen to American music, I'm, I'm kind of aware of these, these different um, music genres. And I told you I like music and I knew it was going to come up. And um, so there, there's different kinds of music and there's some music that's popular, right, um, in Nigeria. And there's music that's popular in Africa overall. And Nigerian music sometimes is, is part of that popular music everywhere. And so when Angelique Kijo won that Grammy, um, some representative or affiliate of one of the very popular Nigerian artists had spoken out and said, oh, it's unfair. You know, she's been winning and winning and winning awards and she just keeps winning these Grammys. And isn't it fair for them to, you know, kind of let a new generation step up and get one of those awards that she keeps winning? And another artist responded. So I just, you know, stumbled on this. I, I didn't even know what's going on. I didn't watch the Grammy. I haven't listened to her album. I know nothing. Um, but another artist responded and said, Angelique Kijo wrote an album with songs or a song that spoke about climate change and the impact of climate change on Africa. And do you think she's not going to win an award for that? Like you think she's not going to win a Grammy for that just because you make music that makes people feel good or is fun or, you know, makes you want to dance. What is the big picture? Who's driving that big picture? And what is it that they want? And so, I mean, we're talking from aerospace engineering, even to music and understanding the times and the signs of the times and the impact of the work that you're doing. Who is it needing to satisfy, right? Who does that work need to satisfy? Who are your stakeholders? Because we all have stakeholders. Everyone reports to someone. Even the number one CEO, even if it's a one man business, a one woman sole entrepreneurship business where you're the CEO, the janitor, the secretary, you know, the administrative assistant, everything you can imagine, you have to answer to someone. And that could be your stakeholders, potential clients, that's who you answer to, right? And so just understanding that this woman, Angeliki Joe, was able to kind of hone in on climate change being critical crucial to the times that we're in, right? You can, I mean, it, it was mind blowing to me that even in music, climate change is important, right? So if you are kind of working on, uh, you know, a grant or proposal or potential contract for funding, and you understand that all your stakeholders are looking for what's green, right? What is going to reduce emissions? What is going to reduce emissions for, aircraft, uh, what's going to reduce fuel and rocket use for spacecraft and launches, or what is going to reduce electricity usage um, in, uh, in the, the hotter climate regions, or, you know, just understanding that that's the times that we're in. And these are uh, potential success stories, if you, if you can kind of hone in on them. I, I, my, I mean, my mind was blown and I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is very interesting that she knew and she honed in on the fact that climate change is very important. So there's a difference between, you know, in music, popularity and, and impact and context, right? Um, and there, you have to understand your stakeholders and what their needs are and you have to understand the times that you're in and um, how to work best with um, people that support detractors and even enemies with that big picture impact. You know, I don't, I don't want what we don't want. Who are we 
and what is it that we want? You know, it's great to work with passion and curiosity in one small piece, but it's also very important to kind of pull your head out every so often and look and try to quantify and understanding and quantify and understand what that what that impact is. So what are the times that we're in? Um, what are the needs? Uh, what is the landscape on a local, national and global perspective? Right. And this is independent of area of expertise, independent of field, independent, independent of genre. I just gave you examples in aerospace and in music as well, right? And showing how you kind of bring yourself up and look again at that big picture. Um, what is the future of major programs and how, how are we at best staying ahead of the curve? Um, and at the minimum, adapting to, you know, the existing forecasted existing and forecasted climate right uh, what does the future look like right we're coming out of this global pandemic phase with with the uh, covid pandemic right and what is the future looking like it's not that oh we're coming out of this pandemic and going back to what it is that we knew worked well everyone going back to work we know what that is right whether it worked well or it didn't that's relative and i don't i don't want to dwell on that but we knew how to work in person and now we're coming to this phase where people are going to be working in this hybrid fashion with some people remote at you know different ends of the continent and um, or even the world right and people in person and what does that look like right i mean we got to get a grip of remote work where everyone was remote and we we knew how to work that in two years we figured that out but now we have to do hybrid across time zones, across geographical locations. These will introduce new problems for sure, but they may also solve old ones, right? So it's not all a challenge, um, but there are things that need to be figured out. Um, and these are questions that some of us, even the most technically advanced, you know, people in aerospace working at NASA have to figure out, right? What does the future of work look like for us? What does hybrid work look like? Uh, my project manager recently said something that stuck with me in, in uh, prioritizing how we do our work and communications. And she said, we're going to try to move to a remote first model, right? Where when we're having a meeting, if we're having a meeting in person, our first thought should be those that are remote so that they continue to contribute and they continue to provide insight, input. Because, you know, it's hard to, to provide input when you're you're considered as you're developing, you know, as, as the teams are developing uh, ideas and trying to work through problems and develop solutions for whatever it is, if you're considered in your remote location as remote first and they look to you for your input and your perspective, the people in the room always tend to provide input and perspective. So that kind of remote first ideology stuck with me. I was like, okay, Okay, let's let's try to see what that looks like, right? And remember, I said it's not always challenging, right? It provides it provides uh, new new opportunities for for growth and change. This conference is one, right? It is uh, 4 a.m. Pacific time and um, noon, um, yeah, noon in in the UK. And uh, Daniel was telling me this conference will have people call, calling in from Australia, people joining from the UK, people joining from the United States. And these are some of the opportunities that have been opened up with this kind of remote um, mode of operating um, for conferences, for research, you know, even, in, even in universities. Imagine, right, the educational opportunities that are open to people that wouldn't have had the access with this with this new environment so again we need to kind of go back to the drawing board and understand how we can best harness utilize and make the most of a hybrid work environment which is what we're ultimately transitioning to um these are some of the questions that that i think you know we, we may need to solve again everyone needs to kind of work through this and, and solve but i hope and you know look forward to the solutions that uh, the brilliant people for sure at Oxford SBS is going to come up with. Um, I'm going to keep an eye out for for this future of major programs and, and what they look like. Um, and hope we can continue to have the conversations that are uh, driven by curiosity, delivery, and an understanding of the stakes, the climates, and the needs of the times that we are in. Know who wants what even if you're driven by passion, even if you're driven by curiosity and just kind of knowing and understanding who those stakeholders are.
very important. Um, Daniel, I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak at this conference and provide the keynote on day three. Uh, please feel free to uh, to to give my email out if if they are asked uh, if the if the audience asks for it or provide any questions to me that that um, people would like answered. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, uh, Wendy, for those lovely words. I want to. I think we're going to do something different today. We figured I might give a few kind of discussant like. Uh, remarks. And then what I'm really hoping for is to see what resonates with the community that's here, what kind of resonated with you, and we'll try to synthesize and um, make uh, synthesize some key themes from this until, let's say, around uh, 115 or so. But I want to just touch on kind of three, four themes I saw based on the level of analysis that Dr. Okolo focused on. I'm going to focus on people, uh, teams, the organizational structure, and then thinking of the technologies as material and as well as uh, systems. And I want to show how kind of how I saw how Dr. Okolo wove together um, the technology through it. And I want to begin actually on a more meta level in terms of her own background and ask ourselves, Almost kind of all of us should ponder, are we using the ability for technology to liberate, emancipate, widen who can run major programs? Are we using that effectively? And I think this is where, you know, Wendy's own background is quite useful. I mean, she's knowing her personally, she's quite a humble person, but I believe she is the first Nigerian to be working at NASA especially in this capacity. She was the first black woman to get a PhD at the University of Texas Arlington. And what we need to ask from that and to see, and you can see that she brings very different translational thinking, incorporating rap into understanding deployment of drones and how you can use umbrella kind of structures to do so. And one of the things we need to be thinking about is are we developing channels like was discussed yesterday, to bring in new perspectives when we think of the future. If major programs is going to change in the future, are we bringing those who can give us that novel perspective? And if you read, if you even look at how Dr. Kola brought up her own story, she was not necessarily thinking up front that she would be running the path she was with major programs. Are we finding or recognizing these top talents? And one of the things she mentioned, which I think all of us can share and relate to on a personal level, is when you're foisted in those roles, you know, there's a desire to learn and stuff, as well as trying to navigate your own building of experience. Are we, as when we identify a recruit, and this came up yesterday towards the end when we're trying to think about major programs and bringing only established individuals, are we misunderstanding insecurities or what she even said imposter syndromes are we misunderstanding and conflating that with talent and i think we have to think about our structures going forward and how are we developing identifying people that are not necessarily thinking about that up front and so technology here is a conduit to liberate to emancipate to revisit impact but we need structures and people and organizations that widen the aperture so that we can find that. The next thing I want to talk about is the teams. What was interesting about what she noted is that there's kind of two things we're thinking about. One is the ways of working. So what is work from er everywhere going to do, work from anywhere going to do for major programs? So on one hand, technology is allowing collaboration, not in the same place, but across. What does that mean for major programs? But also, how does it widen the issues of how we deal with managing conflict or difference amongst teams? So the team's research tells us that data-driven conflicts are more useful, are more, uh, are, are more effective in handling and managing conflict as opposed to interpersonal. The challenge, though, when you're thinking of big science initiatives, as 
Dr. Okolo mentioned, you're dealing with very different specialist areas that are already coming with different data sets. And usually they're the one person representing that group. And so there's this real tension between if the same people are presenting the same kind of data and perspectives, these cognitive conflict can then devolve into interpersonal. I mean, we can use the example she brought up of drones. Let's take two aspects of drones for those of you may not may know or not know. There's the propulsion. How do I get the power to run the drone and the control system? So from the perspective of a control system, it's closed loop for a drone. You don't want to have massive disruptions or massive inputs because not every kind of disturbance is possible to manage in a control system. On the other hand, if you think of propulsion, when you're trying to design an engine, you're trying to make it the most powerful with the least amount of energy. And so already you can just see from the nature of the work that has to be done, there's going to be two data-driven perspectives that will be at conflict. How do we manage those in ways that don't allow that to devolve into interpersonal issues? The other one I want to bring also on a, a meta level that was fascinating was the organizational structures that they were able to benefit from to do their work. So, for example, noted with the pterodactyl project, she noted, they were able to essentially do as an, uh, compete in an internal competition for projects. So there's recent new work on crowdsourcing idea context, contests. What does that mean? in terms of major programs, is this a new organizational structure or method we can use to promote novelty and innovation, having contest competitions to do so? And then in terms of the systems level, when you bring in new folks, when you bring in technology, there's this kind of interesting tension. One is technologies allow you to make wider analogies, thinking about what reimagining the possible is. And you could see those analogies from what uh, Dr. Okolo did by collect, connecting the work of Nigerian musicians on climate change to even how she thinks about stakeholders. At the same time, technology also allows for greater discernment. How can we particularly, and you saw this in her comments that I need to know what I want to do, but what I cannot do. How do we balance that tension between precision to get to delivery, where technology allows us to be more discerning versus technology allowing us to make wider analogies. How do we balance that openness with then the drive into delivery and execution? And one of the things that that kind of brings to bear is that we have kind of in this reimagining of the possible, the expectations grow that we can have tighter safety factors, tighter tolerances for delivery. So while we're reimagining the possible with technology, we're also narrowing the aperture of delivery. And there's this tension that constantly goes about, which leads me to kind of the last point is through the people, through the teams, through the organizational structure and the systems, what is the materiality, the physical quote unquote stuff of a technology? And what does that do in this process of negotiating? On one hand, it's malleable. You can do small tests. You can learn by doing like Dr. Colo mentioned when they were trying to develop the umbrella kind of deployment system for their drones. At the same time, it also can become rigid at times. It changes how social systems operate. Sometimes they're using those systems to grapple with a long standing system, like they were discussing about the safety system that she was developing that had been there for decades and how we're bringing in new technology. The other interesting that comes about it that this materiality. You know, my prior assumption before hearing Dr. Okolo's work is that we often think of this materiality as kind of stationed within one technology. But now we're in situations where technology can operate as autonomous collectives. Think drone swarms, think aircraft formation. Those are developing materiality in a distributed way, even from the physical stuff. Not distributed just because of where it is, but literally the materiality and the coordination is now distributed. How does that make us think of major programs when we have to think of technologies in and of themselves can be autonomous collectives, not a drone, but a drone swarm, not an airplane, but an airplane in formation. And so we have to start thinking how all of these negotiations around people, bringing in novel people, bringing different ways of work, competing data systems, bringing in structures to bring in novelty, bringing in different and new and wider stakeholders, how all that gets negotiated even in their interplay with the physical stuff, either as one or as a distributed whole. 
And so those are just some of the things that I think uh, are coming out of what I saw from Dr. Okolo's work. Um, there was an intentionality, definitely, and I will take this as, as bring her in because I wanted you to see a different perspective from someone who's in the middle, kind of doesn't come at this from the same perspectives we've had historically, which I think is going to widen our aperture and thinking. And if we're trying to think of a future in order to be equipped to formate, for, to have formations on that future, we need to be able to be thinking and theorizing on all the possible variants, not just the representative kind of mean conditions that we think before. And so I think that kind of interrogation that Dr. Kolo invites us all to have, I'm hoping can get synthesized through not just the provocations I give here, but, but others. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and look at some of the, the comments uh, that have been made as well as questions. So some of them we will share with, with, with Dr. Kola directly. So Jim Bernard asks, regarding mentorship and learning, how is knowledge preserved and transferred within each organization formally and informally? Um, I have my thoughts, but I think I'm going to leave them to, to Dr. Kola, which will ask. Um, Gary Davy asked, Dr. Kola, you described very eloquently the curiosity and research work that you conducted arguably the opportunity to fail in the pursuit of objectives, but your enthusiasm was palpable. When you speak about your translation to project management, use words like responsibility, milestones, and targets, and admit that curiosity is stifled to be continued. I think there's this, there's a really nice point that Gary brings up is that it's kind of like the curiosity is driving the serendipity, the reimagination, and at the same time, disciplining how the delivery happens. How do we think of that across? Um, what are your thoughts of how greatness is achieved? I think it's as well as a part of it as well. I think some on the comments have been talking about how we use this to include more diversity and inclusion in major programs. Should discussion move from diversity of not just talent, but also cognitive ability? Could major programs benefit from the ideas of intellectual input or of not so academically out? Why should it matter? This was another point to bring in is that I you know, I intentionally also invited Dr. Colo because she has such different multimodal intersectional diversity. She brings in different forms of communication through music, rap, through aerodynamics, as well as her own identity. And I think when we're thinking of diversity and inclusion, especially with major programs that are putting us at the extremes of trying to find that diverse set of thinking, we need to be thinking more intersectionally about diversity. It's not just about uh, the typical kind of quote unquote binary classifications of gender, race, and so on. It's intellectual uh, perspective. It's the different modes of communication. It's the ways in which integration and translation happens. And technology can be both our promise and our peril in that. And so the other thing, especially if we harken back to yesterday, if we talk about social extremes, we're often also talking about communities, and this is what Carlene and others mentioned about linguistic differences. So you need also a situation to think about technology that's facilitating the integration, not just from quote unquote formalized or academic experience, but also informal and indigenous experience, experience and how to develop technology platforms that treat those equally. And it, in, in some cases, when I even reflect on my own personal community work and working with community organizations, I often tell people I'm doing it in spite of my PhD, because the way we discourse things in academic dialogue is one in which you have to defend points and debate it. And there's a back and forth about how to do that and how to rule out alternatives, etc. That very dialogue is designed to exclude, to convince someone of a single or a set of single right answers. If we take that kind of dialogue and shift it out to community organizations we work with who don't feel already as part of that process, the danger is that discourse can reinforce that exclusion. So we even have to think differently about how we even dialogue about these things. And one perspective I use is I frame myself as someone who's a facilitator, not the solver. The communities often know the problems they're living it. How do we facilitate them being able to solve them on their own terms? And how do we bring our major programs to bear to do that? And that's something we need to really be mindful of in terms of the intellectual background we come from, be it indigenous or over a series of academic um, apprenticeships and training. Um, any other points I'm seeing here? Yep. 
Um, so I think, what time are we at? We have five minutes. It'd be interesting to see any other integration. Um, this was my kind of um, perspective of what I learned from Dr. Cole and how it helped me rethink and reflect on my own kind of experiences across a variety of sectors and major programs. Um, and some have argued that this makes us think of the art of this. And that's a really nice way to think of technology as there are some interesting anthropological works that look at science as the, when we're talking about leading big science here, science as the intersection between art, the actual doing of things and visualizing it and myth. Because when you think of science, you try it and then you have to prove it later. So you have to think almost reimagine or mythicize at some point the science so that you can then later draw it, develop it to then test it. Science is always about trying things and then proving them thereafter if they work or not. So some have argued in anthropology that kind of even art or science or, or this kind of actually, sorry, it's that art is the intersection between um, myth and science. So correction, art is the intersection between uh, myth and science. And so when we think of leading big science from that perspective, some of it is mythical when we're trying to reimagine the possible before we can show it. And one of the generative ways to do it is through the arts and the conceptualizations of our daily life, of our work. Um, the scholar kind of started this was um, the French, French anthropologist uh, Clyde Levi, Claude Levi Strauss, who thought about this as um, the, that science is at the intersection of art and myth. Uh, which I think Benedict's point brings up that we can also think when we're thinking about leading big science, even in major programs, and what does technology both imagine and both help us prove and discern. Um, yeah. Any other, we have a few minutes here. Any other remarks, uh, thinking, thoughts? This was just my curated discussion, but I thought this would be a good chance for the community to take stock and reflect at this point in time. Um, and I think that Dr. Okolo's uh, presentation really invites us to kind of take stock and reflect at this kind of um, towards the, beyond the midpoint stage or just after the midpoint stage of the conference. Well, I see no comments at the moment. Um, I'm hoping that this incites further talk even beyond. So perhaps in the few minutes we have left, we'll go ahead and take a break. We will reconvene back at 1.30. As a reminder, there is um, the drop-ins. If you're still interested in understanding um, the things we're doing with the MSC and are interested in learning more about that, we have the recruitment team. Kate, our recruitment manager, is uh, on, uh, available. And um, at that point, we'll reconvene at 1.30 for what is going to be another quite uh, exciting panel amongst others who are also leading uh, big science initiatives. Thank you so much, and we will see you then.